classed as Assyrian cruelty, whether it's real or it's fictional. Where do we get the idea that Assyrians were cruel? And some of you mentioned this, and that's a, a Excellent point. The Bible, the Old Testament, um, of course, gives inspiration to the idea that the Assyrians were conquerors. Um, and then 19th century Western writers, I should have written that, Western writers. And then Assyrian art and archives. So leaving, uh, in the lingo of attorneys, leaving a paper trail of what you've done in effect. And in this case, as you see the background, leaving a stone trail or an alabaster trail. So we have from the Bible one of the most kind of damning um, chapters, and that's Nahum 3.1. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without prey. The crack of the whip, the rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, and of course, uh, Nahum tells us that when Nineveh was destroyed, everyone was happy. Uh, now, Nahum is, is supposed to be prophecy, but in fact, the book was written after, long after the fall of Nineveh. But there's also in the Bible the story of Jonah, where Jonah, who is kind of the reluctant prophet, uh, who is supposed to go to Nineveh, he doesn't really want to go. And when God saves, decides to save Nineveh because of the uh, prayer and the fasting of its people, what we call today Ba'ut uh, Ninmaya, God tells uh, Jonah, uh, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city? So he calls it that great city, wherein are mo more than six score thousand, 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. In other words, God tells Jonah, in the story uh, that, you know, I have to save this city because after all, they are good people and many of them don't know uh, whether they're doing wrong and this kind of upsets Jonah. Um, but it's apparent that the story of Jonah, which was, by the way, picked up much later by uh, the fathers of the Church of the East uh, in creating what we call Ba'ut et Ninvai. This came much later um, then it's, in other words, it's not a continuous uh, remembrance of this fasting of the story of Jonah. Rather, it's taken uh, from the Church of the East's fathers, uh, particularly in and around uh, Arbella, Nineveh, and Kirkuk in the um, uh, early centuries or later centuries of Christianity. And also, <clears throat> Ezekiel in the Old Testament. It's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with bare branches and so on and so forth. And it's this great tree that, that uh, God has made in the Garden of Eden. And I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the Garden of God envied him. So that doesn't sound like a very bad thing about Assyria, does it? Not really. But fast forward to the Western Church, and um, as alluded to earlier, the idea of, of us versus them, especially during times of empire, when the Western world was taking over the rest of the world, how should the Western world, which viewed itself as just and right and civilized, really understand the ancient world, and especially if that ancient world was distant and far away. And so um, was there a search for the bad guy in the Bible, um, you know, from the Western uh, mind, from Western writers? Well, we see in the early and late 1800s, there was this idea of the cruel Assyrian as being something very unusual. It wasn't just as some of you have said, ordinary course of events. Assyria was an empire whose record was dominated by military conquest, frequently coupled with, listen to this, sadistic treatment of captives, not ordinary treatment, sadistic. One of the foremost influences in Assyrian life was religious 
and war was viewed as a true expression of their religion. Of course, there is no evidence for this, zero evidence. There's also zero evidence that all captives were treated badly by the Assyrians. In fact, many captives were brought, um, many people were transported, and they were alive, and they lived in Assyria. And in fact, they became very influential in Assyria. Among them were Egyptians and people of Mitanni and others who eventually assimilated into uh, the Assyrian culture and Assyrian people. So the fact is that despite the writings of such people, which really are not based on any evidence, uh, British historians and American historians. And uh, one of the writers, uh, W.B. Wright uh, states, fighting was the business of the nation and the priests were incessant tormentors of war. So they, you know, you could kind of imagine, you know, these Assyrian priests running around, you know, getting people all riled up. And of course, this really comes from the imagination of this Western writer. Um, it, it, it is not based on any evidence. It is certainly not based on the textual evidence or historical evidence. They were supported largely from the spoils of conquest of which a fixed percentage was invariably assigned uh, them before others shared, for this race of plunderers was excessively religious. Uh, so <laughs> it kind of makes you laugh, okay? But, but really, um, you'll see that this kind of thinking about the Assyrians has not gone away. And we have a person like Carlton Kuhn telling us the Assyrians have no direct or linguistic survivors which is probably a mercy because they were so bad. This race of plunderers, horrible people. And Erica uh, Bilipitru, who is a, a professor uh, of archaeology at Vienna University, who you would think should know a little better, says Assyrian national history, uh, as it has been preserved for us in inscriptions and pictures, meaning reliefs, consists almost solely of military campaigns and battles. It is as gory and blood curdling a history as we know. So you know that Erica really hasn't read very carefully. But she's not the only one. Um, this recent professor, Thomas Bolin, uh, who wrote a book on Iraq, who's teaching at Norbert College in 2017, tells us that it would not be an overestimate to characterize Assyria's relentless cruelty, not ordinary cruelty, which you thought was the case, but relentless cruelty as religious terrorism, religious terrorism, akin to that being played out in Syria, Iraq, and other countries by ISIS today. So we know that the Assyrians and ISIS share something. Gary Webster, tells us that Assyrian national history has preserved for us in its cuneiform inscriptions and images on walls and floors of palaces and temples and on clay and alabaster tablets, prisms and cylinders consists mainly of military campaigns and battles. It is perhaps the most gory and bloodthirsty of history known. So a lot of these writers, you know, they borrow from each other. Um, they're not creative, neither are they researchers, really, in the true sense of the word. They're not even true journalists. And Joshua Mark, uh, who's another one of these uh, people, uh, says that the kings of the Neo-Syrian Empire have long been considered some of the most ruthless monarchs in ancient history, considered by himself, of course, he considers them. And then we have uh, Paul uh, Krawaziak, a British historian who um, came from Eastern Europe. The Assyrians and their famous rulers with terrifying names. I bet you never knew that the name of Shalmansar and Tiflet Baliza were terrifying names, like Shalmansar, Tiflet Baliza, Sennacherib, Sarhedin, and Ashur Bani Pal. So, how are these terrifying names? Rate right in the popular imagination just below Adar. Adolf Hitler and Genghis Khan for cruelty, violence, and sheer murderous savagery. Not ordinary um, uh, savagery, but murderous savagery. Um, so Paul is a uh, British historian and TV producer. 
so he can make movies about this sheer murderous savagery. And, of course, he's topped off by Simon um, from King's College in London, who tells us that while historians tend to shy away from analogies, well, they don't really. It is tempting to see the Assyrian Empire as a historical forebearer of Nazi Germany, an aggressive, murderously vindictive regime uh, supported by a magnificent and successful war machine. So Simon and Paul and Mark and all of these people, you know they're not careful readers. But nobody, nobody can top off this so-called uh, preacher, um, a person I call Khan Man, and his name is Jonathan Khan. And he tells us that the Assyrians were the masters of terrorism. The Assyrians invented terrorism. Every terrorist is a descendant of the Assyrians. I bet you didn't know that. Now, this person parades himself as a type of a Christian preacher, um, a, one of these neocon people who's always trying to start a war in the Middle East. Um, certainly, I think, uh, what he's preaching is not based on any evidence. Um, again, uh, playing with history, because history tells us, as some of you have pointed out, that in the very Bible, um, God is supposed to have said, O oh, Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. So what is this con man saying is that God is really uh, possibly engaging in terrorism if he is sending the Assyrians who are the terrorists in the ancient world and all terrorists really belong to this line of uh, the Assyrians. Well, now not everybody in the ancient world is thought to be bad uh, and now among non-scholars, common people, this is also a problem. The problem is really understanding history and understanding how and where we get evidence. And I want to read to you some comments that were made by some people asking the question, were the ancient Assyrians as cruel as contemporary sources out uh, made them to be, as sources made them out to be? One of the answers was, the answer is definitely yes. Ditto what others have said. This is copying what others have said. In addition, the Assyrians own commissioned base reliefs, misspelled there, glorify violent sieges and brutal impalement of the conquered. This is one of the reasons that the first Persian empire is revered historically. Coming less than a century after the fall of the Assyrians, the Achaemenid Persian king's extraordinary and enlightened policies of religious slash cultural tolerance and abolishment of slavery, starting first and foremost with Cyrus the Great, Cyrus II was one of mankind's greatest humanistic advancements. Now, we need to point out that none of this, really none of it is true. There was no abolishment of slavery. There was no um, change in the way people in the ancient world were treated by the Persians versus the Assyrians. And I will refer to where this may have come from, this understanding, or I should say misunderstanding. But this is very widespread. A high school asked this question: Were the ancient Assyrians more respected than the Assyrian uh, than excuse me Persians were more respected than the Assyrians? And he says, uh, Robert Prescott, sixth grade teacher. Now you don't want to give him too much credit here for being a researcher himself, but it's important to know what people are thinking about this topic. Assyrians were notorious for being fierce and cruel warriors. They were famous for the atrocities they committed um, after conquering the city. They would stack up the heads of citizens outside the city gate or even more heinous. They would skin the king while he was still alive and nail his skin to the wall. Assyria was a powerful mil military force in ancient Mesopotamia and feared by their neighbors. So some of this stuff obviously is true, but to say that they would do certain things, you've got to talk about time and place. A nation ruling 
for close to a thousand years, not every time the Assyrians attacked the city, they would skin the conquering king. In fact, many kings were forgiven. Many kings were taken to Assyria and they had to sign treaties again. Many kings were dealt with diplomatically, as we saw when we studied King Sargon and King Sennacherib, uh, the way they dealt with the Levant. There were times when they punished people and there were times when they forgave people. Another um, a person tells us that Persians were and are more respected than the Assyrian Empire. The Persians would usually allow their conquered people to keep their customs and religions um, to lessen resistance. And of course, this is another false uh, misunderstanding. It's a false fact. It's a misunderstanding of history. This is the product of propaganda um, by certain Western uh, writers and certainly by the Iranian government. And we'll get to that. And Mahdi tells us, yes, they were. The Assyrians were very brutal conquerors, not just ordinary conquerors, but very brutal conquerors. They practiced what we would call today ethnic cleansing. Again, not a single fact, not a single um, piece of evidence in history shows that Assyrians, in fact, practiced what we call today ethnic cleansing. There is not a single source of evidence for this. The Assyrian rulers forcibly removed subjugated populations from their native lands into other parts of their empire. That's very true. Example, the 10 tribes of Northern Kingdom of Israel. That's not true. There were no such thing as 10 tribes in historical evidence. There is in the Bible a reference to the tribes being removed to Assyria, but they were not killed. They were not destroyed. They lived on in Assyria, according to the Bible. The Assyrians were also brutal in the battlefield. According to many ancient sources, including the Bible, soldiers would rip open pregnant women and they would also throw infants against rocks. Again, this is the mind of the, this person who's writing this. Zero evidence for this. In fact, we will see that the violence committed against certain Assyrians is more blood curdling than you would really like to believe. And we're going to look at one chapter of the Bible for that. Um, the Persians, on the other hand, were not like this at all. Uh, they resettled displaced populations back into their native land and gave freedom of religion all throughout their empire. This is complete false information. Okay, just in case you're thinking about it, uh, just please put it out of your mind because we're going to go over this um, again in, in history when we talk about the Achaemenid Empire. I'm going to bring up more facts about the Persians, but you know, we want to know where does this idea come from? And one of the sources of evidence that people have misinterpreted repeatedly, and much has been built on this misinterpretation, is the Cyrus Cylinder, the so-called Cyrus Cylinder. What is the Cyrus Cylinder? First, it's important to know that it is written in Akkadian. It is not written in Persian. It is not a Persian product. It was written in Babylon. It was kept in Babylon, and it follows the tradition of Assyrian kings in referring to themselves and how they treated conquered populations. So if you think you're going to take the Cyrus Cylinder and reinterpret it and, and juxtapose it against Assyrian sources, you should have another thing coming by the standard of good scholars um, and, and many Assyriologists who see the Cyrus Cylinder is simply a continuation of the Assyrian tradition of dealing with conquered populations. There were times when the Persians killed, there were times when the Persians slaughtered and destroyed and burned, just like the Assyrians and just like other populations. And there were times when they forgave certain populations, just like the Assyrians. And uh, you heard me in the class on King Sennacherib say, I think Sennacherib says very clearly, those people who had nothing to do with fomenting trouble in a particular kingdom, I released them, I let them go. Um, so, so there was absolutely no killing of populations. Sadhaddin takes a lot of pride, uh, even though his father was responsible for attacking Babylon, he takes a lot of pride in allowing people to resettle um, who had left the city of Babylon in, 
and brings them back to Babylon. So this was a very common thing among Assyrian kings prior to the arrival of Cyrus. Cyrus was simply continuing the Assyrian tradition, and this is supported by all of the evidence available to us. It is not supported, however, by the propaganda conducted by, for example, the Iranian government, which likes to see itself, especially during the time of the Shah, as kind of the first kind of human rights, um, wanted to see this or view this as the first human rights declaration and oftentimes mistranslated what was in here. Well, how civilized was the uh, Persian Empire? For example, um, in history, <clears throat> uh, Plu <clears throat> excuse me, Plutarch tells us of scaphism, a practice where um, certain people would be placed in boats and, and kind of um, uh, smothered with milk and honey and, and other products and allowed um, to die slowly and very painfully in the river, uh, especially Still River, where, where vermin, all sorts of vermin would be eating at them. And so uh, uh, Johannes uh, Zanaris, who was a Byzantine writer, tells us that the Persians outvie all other barbarians in the horrid cruelty of their punishments, employing tortures that are pecu uh, peculiarly terrible and long drawn, namely the boats and the sewing men up in raw hides. So there were a number of things that Persians did which were horrible uh, to the modern mind that we often put away because we, we'd like to block all of this stuff with the Cyrus cylinder. Cambyses II was the son of Cyrus and he was not a nice guy at all. In fact, some people, uh, Herodotus, think that he was the mad king, killed a lot of people in Egypt. And in one particular case, uh, a European artist, uh, Gerard David uh, of the Netherlands, paints the story of the Persian judge who was skinned alive by the orders of um, uh, Cambyses, the Persian. So skinning people was, unfortunately, um, a certain type of punishment that certain people, um, um, you know, certain peoples committed, including the Assyrians. So this is something that uh, has been kind of, I don't want to say hidden from history, it's been there, uh, but this is something that uh, we need to know. Were the Persians actually kinder than the Assyrians, as many people in popular culture are led to believe in the West and in the East? Well, not really. Now, some people um, take the understanding of the Assyrians and they form a theory when they engage in archaeology. And uh, one such person is this Haim Cohen, who is a, um, um, working for the Ministry of Health in Israel at Tel Aviv University. He's found a skull, and he has a theory. Well, based on, what's this theory based on? I mean, this person would make a horrible uh, criminal investigator. The Assyrians are known from historical records, he tells us, to have been cruel and unrelenting towards their enemies. I mean, as if ancient peoples in the past were never cruel and unrelenting. Um, however, uh, the evidence for this, osteological evidence, is missing or scarce. We present the case. So he's found a skull which has been smashed of an adult male uh, skeleton dated to the Iron Age II period, so second half of the seventh century, 8th century BC, which is 700s BC. With uh, who manifest traumatic injuries to the skull, left forearm, vertebrae, and ribs. So apparently this skull has suffered a uh, major trauma. Using modern forensic methods, the injuries were studied and the consequences that led to these, and you see the, the skull in the photograph here. Three possible scenarios were presented by this uh, very intelligent uh, researcher. One, wounds inflicted during a chaotic battle. Two, wounds caused by the chasing and capturing of a victim. And three, a commonly practiced violent attitude of Assyrian soldiers toward a captive combatant. Combining all the evidence at hand, the latter scenario appears more likely. This skeleton may therefore be one of the sole tangible physical evidence for the ver veracity of Assyrians' post-battle behavior as depicted in ancient texts and reliefs. 
So you see how silly this is. I mean, in every sense of the word, you know, the, the terms of the investigation here, the, the horrible nature of the conclusion based on this simple evidence, which really could be anything. This could have been an Assyrian soldier, for example. Um, none of this is really known by this researcher, but of course, uh, because he says the Assyrians are known from historical records to have been cruel and unrelenting, that theory leads him to this conclusion, uh, which is just a horrible way of investigating anything, of course. Well, we know that in Egypt, beheadings took place. Um, it was very ordinary and other parts of the body took place. And I have to tell you that we're gonna get more graphic as we uh, go through the, the uh, uh, slides here. But I, but I want to show you what the ancient world was like and then move forward to what Europe was like, what the West was like. And then maybe if we look in the mirror as Americans and as people living in the West, we could also learn a little bit about ourselves when we judge our ancient ancestors for the Assyrians. If you're not an Assyrian, you judge an ancient people in this very uh, cursory way. The brazen bull, of course, was known a uh, way of torturing people in Greece, in ancient Greece, uh, where people were placed in this metallic uh, bull and they were burned and the people could be heard, of course, uh, for, for a much distance. It is said that the person who invented it was also burned in it uh, by, the, uh, by the king. Uh, the Romans were known as all of you know for crucifixion, which is a horrible form of uh, death, um, uh, torture and death. Uh, so people would be nailed uh, to these crosses. And at one point, uh, the Romans crucified over 6,000 people uh, to make a point after a rebellion. Sawing um, was a very common uh, method of, of dealing with people, prisoners, um, the Turks used this uh, against uh, Assyrians and Armenians in certain cases, Persians, Romans, uh, Jews, uh, Vietnamese, uh, sawed Christians uh, who were converts uh, to Christianity. Uh, so this was another horrible method of dying that was common in the world. Impalement um, was known uh, in the ancient Assyrian world, but this method was also found everywhere in the world, including um, in German, uh, Austrian, Italian city-states, other places, Romanians, Hungarians. Uh, as some of you may know the story of Dracula, which was really inspired by um, a person known as Vlad the Impaler, who was a Romanian prince uh, and who was fighting the Turks or the Ottomans at the time, and, and he was known to have impaled many, many thousands of people in Europe. So violence in Western art. Um, it's often thought that the Assyrians were very crass in expressing, very rough, very primitive, uh, unsophisticated, uncivilized perhaps in displaying what had happened. Well, what about in Western art? What about drawing and quartering, for example, uh, the beheading of people in England? Uh, this was uh, a very common way of killing people in Europe. And uh, you could imagine uh, what horrible scenes uh, would result from this. But the king oftentimes would make it a point to cut a person's body up and deliver different parts to different uh, areas of the kingdom in England to make sure that people knew uh, not to uh, tamper with the king's power or the king's authority. Um, is this cruel? Is it unusual? Well, it's uh, a way of dealing with your subjects, not necessarily your enemies, but even your subjects in England. And of course, we know that in civilized England, uh, where a lot of the writers uh, came from criticizing Assyrians for being overly cruel, and especially in beheading people, um, such a thing unheard of. Well, of course, it was heard of uh, in London. Uh, the ritual began in the 1300s when people's heads were posted in the Tower of London and in other places. 
um, at certain points, uh, uh, there were about 30 heads uh, placed in the Tower of London to make a point. Uh, even kings and queens were killed. Now, these heads oftentimes would be painted so that they could be preserved, so that they could stick around longer. And, you know, ordinary people would walk um, before them and they would be seen. And it was to make a point, to show authority in England. And even worse than that, uh, Protestants in the 13th century were burned by um, English Catholics and for heresy. And you could see this in, in this horrible uh, drawing, which was uh, uh, written by a man named Fox, uh, the Book of Martyrs. Uh, such a horrible way to die. But uh, children were also uh, sacrificed, even, even the children of uh, people who uh, were these um, uh, so-called martyrs, actually, in history. <clears throat> in the 1500s, now we're going to while this is happening in England, something else is brewing in Assyria that we're going to um, find out about when we talk about uh, splitting of the church into the Chaldean church. What, what the church of the east is going to split into a different branch of the Chaldean church. So while the Assyrians are kind of in this conflict, in this struggle in the 1500s between Mariuhan and Sulaqa in England, we have the burning of Protestants. And of course, in Scotland, uh, we have a great deal of pride in the 15th century of uh, showing severed heads. And this is a biblical story, of course. It's the story of John the Baptist, whose head gets severed. Just in case you were thinking that the severing of heads was limited to Assyrians or was artistically not really represented by Europeans, well, here you go, in the 15th century in Scotland. And of course, in Judith, uh, the story of Judith in the Bible, uh, European paintings painted this, and, uh, and Judith takes great pride in severing the head of a human being, uh, being assisted by God. Um, she asks God for help as she slaughters um, a whole of Fernes, who is supposed to be an Assyrian general under the command of Nebuchadnezzar. The history there is skewed, of course. It's, it's uh, misunderstood in the Bible. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, uh, was not uh, um, sending an Assyrian general. Nothing in history records that. But this story is uh, a very interesting story in the Bible of how cruel a human being can be uh, being guided, uh, supposedly being guided by God. All right? That's in the Old Testament. What's also interesting is how Europeans took a lot of pride in demonstrating um, this uh, part of history in a very graphic way. And uh, just in case you thought that this was, well, too graphic, well, there's Judith of the Bible, uh, you know, going after the Assyrian general's uh, neck. And uh, this was a great work of art in Europe. And a lot of people took a lot of pride in these paintings, a lot of the artists. We could talk in detail about some of these artworks, but I think we'll leave it for, for another uh, class. Uh, we also have the story of the uh, Greek myth of, of um, Medusa, who, whose head was severed uh, by Persis of course, not perceived to be cruel by any stretch of the imagination. It's just something he had to do to someone evil. And in case you thought the severing of heads was all over, you could um, look at the reimagined in 2008 um, sculpture by Luciano Garbati, an Argentinian uh, Italian uh, sculptor who reverses the roles and has Medusa severing the head of Persis rather than uh, Medusa's head being severed. And this, this sculpture was thought to be uh, kind of a, um, um, you know, a bit of a, a trademark for the Me Too movement. Uh, in other words, women can sever heads of men rather than the other way around. So that we won't forget um, our role in history as Americans and some of the horrible things that we've done to our fellow citizens 
we should remember the lynchings that happened uh, very recently in history. And just take a look at these horrible people um, and, and you judge for yourself whether these people are any more civilized than your ancient ancestors in, in what is being done here uh, to certain people. And in case we think that this is limited to the United States, that the severing of heads is, uh, um, you know, something from the ancient past. Well, here you see Turkish soldiers holding the heads of Kurdish fighters. And uh, these are horrible pictures, and I apologize for showing them to you, but I think it makes the point that uh, man's inhumanity to man uh, in the way uh, of the treatment of bodies is something that is with us even today. And of course, we have to ask ourselves uh, whether the bomb, you know, tossed in Hiroshima is something that um, is more humane than, uh, for example, uh, the Assyrian art created in the ancient past. Something to think about. Uh, this was a point that I brought up to a person that was at the Oriental Institute and said, you know, the Assyrians were very cruel. Look at their reliefs. Look what they show. And I asked her if, if she thought the bombing of Hiroshima was just as cruel or not more cruel than the severing of heads in the ancient past. And her answer was, well, we don't, we're not proud of it. Um, so something to think about here. Well, we look pretty proud here. Um, American soldiers holding the heads of Vietnamese, um, uh, either prisoners or fighters. Um, and this is a horrible picture to look at, of course, but it's with us today. Uh, and just in case you thought that this was all over, uh, this is a, an American soldier in Iraq in 2003 um, in this very, very horrible um, uh, showing of mistreatment of an Iraqi prisoner and taking pride and taking photos. And there were, of course, thousands of such photos which were leaked to the press to the great shame of the United States. And in case you thought the heads are gone, well, artistically, they're not gone in London. And uh, I believe this display is no longer around, but you can see in the modern age, we're reminded by how heads would be displayed in, um, in London. Well, there's two important facts to know. So going back in history, the Assyrians love to record, as many of you know, not only what they did, but what others did around them. No civilization in the ancient world recorded as much as the Assyrians did. This is very true. They told us a lot about the war and battles, but they also told us about literature, diplomacy, building, farming, medicine, astronomy, and astrology. One writer, Andre Perot, tells us that no other civilization wrote so much as the ancient Assyrians. So they wrote a lot. In recording what they did, the Assyrians were graphic. They wanted us to know the details. Take a look at the artwork that you see of the lion being carried, the dead lion. Their documentation was specific, complete, and exhaustive. Again, we do not find in the ancient world such detail of battles and wars. We do not know what other ancient peoples did or even what they bragged about because their documentation, their art was not as detailed and exhaustive as that of ancient Assyria. So when we look at images like this, we might think to ourselves, okay, there's a lot of cruel things, but we also have to understand that the ancients were telling a truth about what had happened either in battle or as King Sennacherib shows, and, and as Nineveh is being dug up, we'll see more things like this. Um, we will see the building of castles, for example, the, the coming together of gardens, the uh, hunting of animals, the lives of other people, uh, diplomatic meetings, and so on and so forth. So by no means is it true to say about the Assyrians that their entire history was a recording of battles. And I'd like to end with quoting um, one of the great writers of, uh, about Assyrian history, who is the author of The Arts of Assyria. He tells us, no other ancient civilization has bequeathed to the world so vast 
a corpus of documents. And although he's not talking specifically about the Asher Bunny Paul Library, this image is of contents of the Asher Bunny Paul Library in the British Museum. 